This had been an attack line in conservative media for weeks and weeks and months now as this story has unfolded, but it's finally popping into the liberal bubble with even the Times getting in on it, and it's a really bad look for Biden. Hey guys, I'm Hannah Cox with Brad Palumbo at Base Politics. This week on the podcast, Joe Biden's missing grandchild, Jonah Hill drama, AOC, Obama, and more. Let's jump in. We missed you guys over the holiday. We need to get into some drama around President Biden and his family, which seems to be missing somebody by his count, it sounds like. Yeah, let's roll this clip to give folks an idea of what's going on. The best part of it all, I have six grandchildren, and I'm crazy about them. And I speak to them every single day. Not a joke. Well, the sixth count obviously leaves out Hunter Biden's four-year-old daughter. Uh, according to court documents, a paternity test has proven that she is indeed Hunter's. He just recently settled a child support case in her interests. Mm -hmm. The New York Times is now reporting that leaving her out has essentially become a new White House policy. They write in strategy meetings, aides have been told that the Bidens have six, not seven, grandchildren. So this is a thing, and it's finally making waves now that a liberal New York Times columnist just published a bombshell column saying, it's seven grandchildren, Mr. President calling out Biden for this. This had been an attack line in conservative media for weeks and weeks and months now as this story has unfolded, but it's finally popping into the liberal bubble with even the Times getting in on it, and it's a really bad look for Biden. So he's on the record all the time saying he has six grandchildren. Dr. Jill Biden even uh, dedicated her book to her six grandchildren. And there's just one problem. That's a lie. They have seven grandchildren, including one who they are consciously and actively choosing to ignore and not recognize, a four-year-old girl named Navy Joan, who is Hunter Biden's four-year-old daughter he had with a woman named London Roberts. Look, I just think this is the most bizarre thing. They have, a, well, who cares these days about an illegitimate child or out of wedlock or anything like that? Now, in this case... Apparently, the mother met Hunter Biden while she was working as a stripper. But, like, the child didn't do anything wrong. I get that Hunter is shady and this woman might not be viewed as worthy of the Biden family or whatever nonsense they might have going on in their head. But to punish a four-year-old girl with disowning her while you're having your other grandchildren at the White House and they're the center of your life, I mean, you're turning your back on your own flesh and blood just for what? I, I don't understand it. I think it's frankly, frankly evil. I think it's really vile. I think it's very sad. And it's it's honestly kind of confusing to me because this is something, you know, traditionally like old money families maybe did in the South to try to like deny that their kid had sex outside of wedlock or things like that. You were the president of the United States. I don't think you get to have privacy. You don't get to have secrets. Everybody knows that this child is out there. So what is the point in denying them other than just cruelty you know to me it seems like because of who the mother is and I will say like there does seem to be an element of like kind of gold digging here this woman obviously was probably trying to get her bag and have a kid and I don't support women who do that either but I think probably it's because of her position you know it's very still frowned upon in society to be a stripper to be a sex worker at all and even though Democrats like to pretend they're pretty progressive on some of these things. They're often inconsistent. And let's be honest, Joe Biden is not a progressive. He's, I don't even think he's probably with us on like gay marriage. He's gone along to get along in his career. But uh, I think probably this is something that's embarrassing to them. But they think that they're going to somehow sweep it under the rug. And, and maybe maybe they were somewhat right, because it does seem the mainstream media wasn't really picking up on the story as much as conservative media was for some time. But People knew, and I, I do just feel so bad for these kids, especially in this age. You know, you're going to grow up at some point. You're going to Google your name. You're going to read all the reports on things like this. And I just can't imagine how painful that would be for a child to feel so rejected by their family and so publicly rejected by their family. And all this stuff isn't this kid's fault. Even if the um, mom is a gold digger, and I don't know, but even if she is, the kid is, that's not this four-year-old girl's fault. And how are you going to disown an innocent four-year-old girl, but not your crackhead criminal son? <laughs> That's Fair an excellent different. point. <laughs> That's He's a still, very good question. Hunter Biden is still in his dad's 
intimate circle. He's got him at the White House, despite all his problems. And yet this four-year-old girl isn't good enough because of the sins of her parentage or whatever. I think it's so bizarre because even as a matter of publicity, if he had quietly acknowledged her and included her and put her, they put out six stockings at the White House for the grandkids, right? Not seven. If they just put out one, if they just said seven grandkids, it wouldn't be a story. It wouldn't get any attention. So even from a PR perspective, this is way worse for the Bidens. I would agree with that. It, it really, it doesn't track. Again, I don't understand what they think they're going to get away with here. And it's, as a whole, just really makes me uh, cringe. I think it's very just, I don't know, it feels very openly just mean and mean-spirited and almost punitive towards that child and her mother. And I, I mean, I do think you see this sometimes, again, when like the mother's not been a part of the family when there's like bad blood between the the parents you'll see the family take one side but to take the extra step of like just really rubbing it in that you're not going to acknowledge this kid she's not going to be counted amongst your family it's it's very sad it's terrible and but the reason it's a bigger story than just biden's personal failing is to me and the reason i'm interested in this story is because of what it tells us about partisanship and tribalization in in our politics because Look, when Trump was president, he had allies in the media or out there who would literally defend anything he said or did, no matter how crazy or ridiculous. And now we're witnessing the same phenomena with President Biden, where his simps in the media are defending just an objectively cruel and terrible thing. They're making excuses for it just because that's their guy and they're on Team Blue or whatever. And it, to me, it's just totally morally and intellectually bankrupt Take a listen to the uh, excuse making going on over at The View, where they were trying to explain or wave away this incident and this saga. Uh, scarring his, one of his grandchildren's lives by not publicly embracing her. So apparently his son had a baby with a woman. They've fought about it. And... He pays for the, uh, for the baby, but he has not embraced the child. So Maureen Dowd is saying it's bad for the child that the president has not acknowledged her. So I, I kind of think, well, that's a, she should be fetching at the son whose baby it is. You, it's not the president's baby. So I don't know what you think, but I'm throwing it out. I agree with you completely. It shouldn't have been uh, It's uh, uh, directed to Joe Biden. It should be directed to Hunter Biden. It's five children, not four, Hunter, because this is not Joe Biden's baby. And I think it's very hard for Joe Biden to be a grandfather to the child if his son is not being a father. He can talk to his child. He can advise Hunter. But look, what is, what is absolutely evident to me is that the right wing and the MAGA world has decided to weaponize Hunter Biden against yeah. his dad. Yeah. And everything and anything Hunter does or does not do is going to be weaponized. But and this and is Maureen Dowd at the New York Yeah, Times. she's a very serious person. So I think that is such bull crap, this idea that, well, it's really all Hunter Biden. No, even if Hunter is a deadbeat dad, Biden could still invite his granddaughter to the White House saying, you're part of my family. We want to get to know you. We support you. You're part of this family. I dedicate this book to my seven grandchildren. I don't care. If I have a son one day and they're a deadbeat dad to a child, that's still my grandchild. I wouldn't cut them out because my son's a deadbeat. I would never even fathom such a thing. I would go around my son and meanwhile be telling my son, get your crap together. You have a child. Be a man. Start being a real father. Stop being a loser. This attempt to pin blame on Hunter Biden or to say it's just Republicans pouncing or trying to smear Biden. No, it's Biden choosing for himself an objectively immoral path in his family. And they're just trying to what about it by pointing at Hunter or shifting the blame. And I'm like, why? Why defend this? Why defend the indefensible? You don't have to. You really don't have to. Well, I think the thing we have to grapple with here actually traces back a little bit further, and that is that Hunter Biden largely turned out like he has because of his parenting. I don't like to fully blame parents or children for one or the other. I think people are, they have autonomy. Of course, you have some parents who do everything right and the kid still turns out to be a loser, but it's not as common. I think that 
Hunter seems like somebody who has never been held responsible, who has never been checked, who has never been actually disciplined. It seems like he's gotten away with everything but murder throughout his life. His dad continues to cover for him. And I think that that is the problem. That's why he's turned out this way. That's why you now have him being a deadbeat dad. I don't think that comes from nowhere, right? And in my family, like if you had a kid, yeah, that's exactly how my parents would be behaving. They would be acknowledging it. They would be trying to take care of it and they would be holding your feet to the fire if you were trying to skirt those responsibilities. And I think that that is a huge problem in our society when you see people who have these kids that they spoil their whole lives and they turn out to be terrible parents. And you're thinking like, how did this end up this way? But it is a generational curse, right? It is a cycle that you see repeated throughout families. When you've got somebody who's just completely wild and out, usually it's because their parents were hot messes too. And unfortunately, it often means their kids are going to be hot messes because nobody's coming in to actually right the ship and to actually require that they shape up and get their acts together. So I hate it for everybody involved, but I, I don't think that Joe Biden gets a pass on this whatsoever. And I think that he should be asked a lot more about Hunter by the media in general than he is. If, if one of Trump's children were acting this way, can you imagine? They I mean, did. Just, they did. They, they obsessed hurting. over all the various well, misdeeds of Trump's but, kids. I'm saying, like, when his he kids were office. actually pretty straight laced kids. Pretty. They turned out pretty decent as a whole. Like. None of them are out there wild now doing crazy stuff. Ivanka's successful. Tiffany's going to law school. Jared's in there running foreign policy, which I don't know if that there's, was a there's good some decision, shitty like, like corruption things like, with their kids, like financially. Sure. But I But I, they I, were yeah, on I, the as a whole, you know, like they seem to be somewhat on the straight and narrow, have their own families, be doing the right things, and yet they got tons of scrutiny and you never see that same energy directed back and you certainly never see joe biden required to answer for it it's always the thing of like that's his kid that's not his fault no it is his fault <laughs> like you raise a kid like this you should have to answer for it and he's a menace to society yeah i i will just i want to shout out my friend Alyssa farrah griffin the one host of the view who is center right she did call out how terrible this is and like you said how this kid is going to grow up uh and know that they were rejected by the most powerful person in america take a listen to what she had to say yeah. Um, I just, I will preface this. It makes me uncomfortable even to talk about, and you guys know I have a sister who's a recovering addict. I couldn't have more sympathy for the struggles that come with that. I also have estrangement in my family. I can't have a birthday pass or a holiday that I don't think of the phone call I'm not receiving that day. Because you're estranged and from your dad. I'm estranged from my father, and <clears throat> I can't pretend to know what's going on with the child, but I know that someday she will be old enough to read and hear the speeches where he says, my six grandchildren, and just leaves out that there's the seventh. If he could even just change that language to me, that would be enough because I don't know what's going on behind closed doors, but she will someday be old enough to know that he was choosing to reject her and not acknowledge her as his child. So it's just crazy to me that only like the one conservative on the panel or whatever can even point out the basic fact that he's going to be hurting this child profoundly by rejecting him or her so publicly. Yeah, it's a pretty tribal mentality to me, but I think on an even deeper level, the amount that people don't understand how these things affect kids, it's its really quite shocking for where we're at in the age of information. Um, we've learned a lot, but from adoption trauma to not having both parents present to having a, a parent that's uh, neglectful, these are wounds that people carry throughout their lives. And yes, people can be resilient and yes, people can find ways to move forward. But I think Alyssa's right when she says this is like a, a ever constant void in your life that even when you're an adult and you're choosing the estrangement, it's still something that is a very deep wound that you are always thinking of and lacking and missing in your life. And I, I think it's very just crass and cruel to uh, to put a kid through this and to not think through some of these choices and how they will ultimately impact her. So I, I think it's really irresponsible, I guess, at the end of the day. It's, it's very reckless with a, a human life. Hey guys, Brad here. I just wanna make sure you're staying in the loop on all things face politics. We've also got two new shows you should check out. One is my new show, Damage Control, where I'm teaming up with right of center LGBT guests to restore sanity on these increasingly unhinged issues. Then there's Hannah's show, Copaganda, where she's reacting to videos of police brutality and exposing the systemic flaws in the US criminal justice system. Check these all out on our individual Facebook and YouTube pages. And remember, Base Politics is a nonprofit organization you can help us move the culture through content by going to base-politics.com and donating today. So, Anna, now we're going to talk about some celebrity uh, entertainment news, which 
is not usually my thing, but it's just been all over the internet. Jonah Hill this, Jonah Hill this, Jonah Hill this. What the heck is going on? Yeah, I had to finally learn who Jonah Hill was, to be honest, because this is just oh, taking over on. my timeline. You're no, the only reason I knew of him beforehand was he did that documentary a few months ago with his therapist called Stutz on Netflix yeah, that oh I did yeah, like. I love that, but I all, you've like never that. seen his movies? They're huge. No, I don't think he's my type of movie. But yeah, so Jonah Hill is an actor, comedian, kind of like resident, like fat guy in the movies, right? Like that's kind of a stick. <laughs> like, right? Am I right? Well, I think no, I'm right. It used to be more so, at least. Yeah. yeah. So he starts dating this girl who is a surfer. She's a coach. She has like, you know, tens of thousands of followers on Instagram. She's not famous, but this is her niche. She's really into it. She's a very fit girl, very athletic. And he slides into her DMs and they start dating. And they apparently date for about a year or so. This has long since been broken up, okay? He already has another partner. He has a baby that he's either had or is about to have with this other partner. This this surfer girl is in the past. And yet, for whatever reason, over the past week, she decided that she needed to drop a bombshell on the internet and release their private text communications. Um, and they have been sparking a conversation that I think both you and I are really very interested in. So... I, guys, I'm not going to read all of the text messages because she has literally released like dozens of their private communications. But the one that's getting the most traction, I will read. And it is a text from him to her where he writes, plain and simple, if you need surfing with men, boundaryless, inappropriate friendships with men, to model, to post pictures of yourself in a bathing suit, to post sexual pictures, Friendships with women who are in unstable places and from your wild recent past beyond getting a lunch or coffee or something respectful. I am not the right partner for you. If these things bring to you a place of happiness, I support it and there will be no hard feelings. These are my boundaries for romantic partnership, my boundaries with you based on the ways these actions have hurt our trust. She posted this with the caption, see the misuse of the term boundaries. And she's gone on to insinuate that he was very controlling, abusive, that he um, basically like is a narcissist. She's just painted him to be a very, very bad guy. And I feel like the internet has been very split in its reaction to this. A lot of men have said, these are just boundaries. He's doing nothing wrong. He's you know, communicating his boundaries. And a lot of women have said, no, this is controlling. This is narcissistic. This is abusive. And women should, you know, know about this and be prepared. And then other people, I think you and I included, have been like, why are you posting this online? <laughs> because yeah. it really does just seem to be a violation of privacy within the confines of a relationship that I think everyone is entitled to. I don't like the idea in society that we're getting to this point where if you're no longer friends with someone or if you have a breakup with someone that you're then going to take your private communications and air them after the fact to try to paint that person in a certain light. You can be very selective about what you're putting out there. You can even edit screenshots. Shocker, I know people, but you can't believe everything you see on the internet. And as a whole, unless there was like a criminal case or there was some actual instance of abuse or something that people really needed to know about, I just find this entire thing to be really not a great trajectory in our society. I don't want that to be the norm. I don't want to just sit here and guard every text that I send. I already do that a little bit because I've worked with attorneys and they're like, put nothing in writing ever. Yeah, we are, I send voice notes to everyone now when I'm about to say something controversial. I do. I voice note all the time because I've been scared out of my mind for a minute about this. But it's it does feel to me that this is something that should have remained between them. But now that it's out there, I do want to prod the conversation a little bit more because I do think it's a learning moment perhaps. And I'm curious, Brad, before I weigh in, what was your reaction? Did you see this as a man as being abusive? No, um, I think I don't. And I, I take umbrage to the way that Jonah Hill has been called a toxic man or an abuser or a controller over these texts where we don't know the side of the story. We don't know the full picture. We know one select. We don't really know what was going on. Uh, we know her side of the story. And I also have a huge red flag of why is she releasing this? other than to attack him or start drama a, a long time after they're not together and he's moved on, he's got a new partner, he's having a baby. If it wasn't right for you and you moved on and you have some bitter feelings about it, okay, but it's like, this seems very petty and vindictive to go public. Now, I will say this. These are his boundaries that he lays out. These seem unreasonable, right? These do not seem like fair or reasonable boundaries. 
to require of your romantic partner who is a surfer, who is trying to build a brand. But <clears throat> he's not saying like, you must do this. He's simply saying like, these are my boundaries and maybe it's we're not a good fit. And she should have just said, you're right, we're not a good fit. End of the relationship there. Instead, she went along with it completely voluntarily for everything we knew just two years later, then release it and paint him as some sort of abuser, uh, really. And she knows what she's doing. And that's really, I think, unfair to him to conflate him with all these Me Too men who really are abusive when he was have a setting expectations and boundaries that might have been unreasonable. But the response then is to say, all right, then I'm not the right fit for you, not to try to claim that he's being abusive by just saying, I don't want my partner to do these things. I'm not comfortable with these things. Now, a lot of people have pointed out that he met her on Instagram when she was a surfer, was posting photos of her surfing, and then added these expectations that were clearly not what she was already doing. And so it's like, well, hang on. If you're not comfortable with a woman surfing with a man, why why are you sliding to the DMs of a wannabe like professional surfer or whatever? Obviously, they're going to surf with people of the opposite sex. So he is certainly has some fair share of like, blame here for being unreasonable in a lot of ways but he's not an abuser this is at least from what we know this is not abuse this is overbearing this is unreasonable but it's simply he's saying like i he even says like i will love and support that path for you if we're not right this is just what i'm looking for in a relationship and you know that's how we're, dating works is like you're trying to see if you are compatible with someone and she should have simply said you're right we're not compatible and he could find somebody who is okay with those unreasonable what to me it's it's a, it's subjective what's reasonable what's unreasonable to me it's unreasonable but maybe out somewhere out there is is fine with that and does want to have this like ultra conservative not in a political sense like boundaries and so be it but i don't think this is I think he's getting a, a rough time of things. I think he's being kind of unfairly maligned. Um, but I, I do think it, it, it is a little, it, it is kind of crazy, some of the stuff he was saying. But it shouldn't have been published. There's no need for this. And he's getting a bad rap, in my opinion. Whew, so I think there's so much to unpack here. I'm like, where do I even start? First and foremost, I think ever since the Me Too movement started, I've had a major issue with terms being conflated and there not being enough nuance in conversations because there can be problematic behavior in relationships that is not assault, that is not abuse, and, and it can still have a word that is a disfavorable adjective and it can still be discussed and something that we have a conversation about as men and women in society when it comes to dating relationships. But I, I really do think there's this tendency to dump everything into buckets that are really atrocious, right? Like not assault and rape and abuse. These are really serious things that that harm people, that that rip their lives away from them, either either emotionally or physically. Um, and I don't think that it does victims a, a service to try to conflate things that are not. It, it, this, this story in particular does remind me a lot of the Aziz and Zari story that broke during the height of Me Too, where... Uh, a girl came out and basically tried to say she'd been me tooed by Aziz. And it was like they had this like kind of awkward consensual sexual first date that sounded terrible and I would have left and not have participated in. But it wasn't abuse. It wasn't assault. And yet he got treated the same as like a Harvey Weinstein. This kind of reminds me of that. We're like not every, you know, bad thing or, or thing that's unpleasant that happens to you in a relationship rises to the level of like trauma, which is what she's trying to clearly paint the picture as. I think when I read this that, you know, my first thought is I would never date somebody like this. I do understand um, why there is a tendency for people to rush to call this abuse because what he is doing is a precursor to abuse. And I think that that is very fair to say. Very controlling behavior, trying to isolate someone from their friends, trying to tell someone they cannot have any communication with the opposite gender, trying to police what somebody wears, how they are presented in public. All of these are... are 101 red flag behaviors that I think everybody should be very aware of, but women in particular, because we are more prone to being yeah. victims of domestic abuse. And again, this is not something I would allow in my relationship. As you pointed out, he pursued her based on who she was and then was trying to change those very basic things about herself and her career. I don't like that whatsoever. I think this is a tendency with men. You often see 
this perception in society that, you know, controlling men want weak women. No, they often want strong, capable, successful women, and then they want to make them conform to them in their way of doing things. They want to knock them down a peg or it's kind of like, you know, women who chase the perpetual bachelors like Leonardo DiCaprio. They want the thrill of like being the one to change them. I see this happen a lot. I also see oftentimes men are very attracted to women who are, you know, at the top of their game. They see somebody who's successful in whatever industry they're in or who has a lot of followers or who's really pretty or who's just like, you know, life of the party. And they're like, I want to be with that girl. And they think that in obtaining them, it's going to give them status. And maybe like some of those traits are going to rub off on them. But then when they're having to be with them every day in and out, and they're having to kind of compare themselves to their partner and stack up next to them, they feel very bad about themselves. It makes them insecure and they start to be threatened by the very things that attracted them to their partner in the first place. And that's what seems to have happened here in this situation with Jonah Hill, where it seems like he liked that she was posting in pictures with the bikinis and surfing and had a bunch of friends and was out and influencing all this. And then all of a sudden he didn't like that and it was making him insecure. And so I, I understand like that that is something that we should, you know, have a dialogue about. That's not abuse. And that is that has been my main issue with this whole conversation is that is different than abuse. And, you know, that might be his boundaries. And I think that you should look for people who have similar values to you. But these values are extreme, right? These are in there yeah. might be people in like very traditional Christian relationships that would say this is appropriate. And if that's something that you guys agree upon and you share those values, then you can live in that kind of relationship. I do think it's important for men to know that increasingly that is not what women are looking for in society and that most people, um, especially women who have been through actual abuse or other things in the past, are going to see this as very problematic behavior and request. Um, and so I think that that's, yeah, I think that that's important to name um, and for men to recognize that, you know, maybe instead of like taking this out on the woman, maybe instead of, you know, needing her to conform or be in a box to make you feel safe, maybe you need to get some therapy. Maybe you need to work on your own issues. Maybe you need to work on yourself so you feel a bit more confident and don't feel threatened all the time. The list goes on. But I, yeah, that's kind of where I land on this. I don't it's, think um, she it, but. His demands uh, do scream insecure to yeah. me. Yeah. But I will Very. say. I, I get what you're saying about how st this kind of controlling behavior can be a precursor to abuse, but it's certainly not like necessarily, and I know you weren't saying it is, some people just have very, you know, want to have a very strict relationship, like the, the whole Mike Pence rule thing, right? And I personally don't mesh with that. But like, I think if two people want to do that, it's like their relationship, their rules, figure it out so if he wants to have some extreme rules extreme boundaries in his relationship i mean i i don't not, not that there's no problem with it but it's just no one else's business to me it just really should have just been she shouldn't have gone along with this for more than a few <laughs> weeks when she realized that she wanted that he was like this or as soon as she did she should have just said we're not a good match match and moved on and then not done this kind of petty and vindictive kind of me too cancellation attempt is really what this is um to a guy who from everything we know did not abuse her that'd be a very different story to me it just shows like the weaponization of social media and of personal grievances and of one-sided stories and i just think it's harmful um because the more that you give things like this that are easy to discount the more people will discount all the allegations and all the stories that people come out with. Um, so yeah, look, I, I try it. This was celebrity drama that bled into the political world. And I do think there are some interesting dynamics at play that make it different from your typical tabloid stuff. Um, but yeah, to me, well, it's, yeah. I want to add one more caveat, which is that when you are in an abusive relationship, it often does not start off being abusive and it often does not start off being controlling. And by the time the person does start evoking some of these behaviors and demands, sometimes people are pretty attached. They are pretty mentally broken down, emotionally broken down. Often the abuser has been kind of hurting their self-confidence for some time. So I do want to be careful that when we're talking about these things, we're not just like, well, you should leave because sometimes it is a bit more difficult than people think to leave those kinds of situations. What I think we should say to women, though, is when somebody starts saying these things to you and making these kinds of demands, that is a red flag. And you should recognize that this is controlling behavior. And unless that is what you're looking for, 
you need to recognize early signs and go ahead and get out. Because I'm guessing what happened is this happened to her. She didn't leave. It probably got worse between them. And now she's bitter about it. And But I think that instead of saying, like, he's abusive and he sucks, like a year or two later, you should have just said, you know, these were bad signs early on other women should be aware of if you see that happening in your relationship before you get too attached or before you get too sucked in because it will go downhill from here. Something like that would be appropriate. I still don't like sharing personal communications for this kind of thing, but I guess that's kind of where I'd leave it. Hey guys, Hannah here. Big things are happening at Base Politics and we want to make sure you stay in the loop with all of our productions and developments. If you like the Base Politics podcast, you can find it every Wednesday morning on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Brad's YouTube. If you want to support the show, be sure to join the Base Politics Locals channel where you can help produce it for only $5 a month. You can also catch our new shows, Copaganda and Damage Control, every Saturday on our respective YouTubes and Facebook channels. On Damage Control, Brad teams up with Right of Center LGBT guests to restore sanity to the increasingly unhinged debate over these issues. And on Copaganda, I'm taking video footage of police behaving badly every week and using those videos to expose problems within U.S. policing and the laws that guide it. Remember, Base Politics is a nonprofit organization dedicated to moving the culture through content. If you want to be a part of these efforts, you can donate to fund our work at base-politics.com. Let's move on to our next quick hit. What's up next? So we've got to talk about Bidenomics, which is the big thing that all the Team Biden shells are just out here pushing for the president. His economic record is apparently something they want to embrace, even though it, in many ways it's a big weakness of his. So we've got his allies coming up with stuff like this from a big Democrat talking head TikToker. Take a look. So ride with Biden. Unemployment has been below 4% for the longest stretch in 50 years. Inflation is half of what it was a year ago. Wages are going up, beginning to outpace inflation. Combine this with the fact that Biden has added 13 million jobs to the economy in two and a half years. That's more than any president in four years. Bidenomics, I think so. First up, Hannah, I want to know if he's been to the White House recently, because I think we just found the source of that cocaine. Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought it was Kamala, but now my money's on this guy for sure. Also, it, I don't know. These these do not feel organic to me. This no, feels, the, the like, talking points go out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is like just next level. I want to get into a couple of the specific points here. Like, for example, he points to the unemployment rate, and it is decent, but it's basically just back to near what it was pre-pandemic. Same thing with these 13 million jobs created. First off, Biden didn't create those jobs. The private sector did. And it's basically just all the jobs that were lost from the pandemic now recovering. We've barely recovered from the pandemic. So it's you have this big number, but that's because the whole economy was closed when you took office, still a lot of it. And then it was slowly reopened at the state level over the course of the presidency. And so then he has these big job numbers, but it's not as if he did something special to, to create those jobs. Uh, and I laugh so much when he says inflation is half of what it was when Biden took office. You know that that is not how like inflation works. Like that just means we're no. getting poorer at a, at a lower rate than we were getting poorer. Everything about this is just asshat backwards. And that's why I said it doesn't seem organic. One, I don't think this guy could explain any of the terms that he just used in this video. I would love to sit him down and be like, what's inflation? <laughs> How's the unemployment rate calculated? I would love to quiz him on these things because there's no way he knows. But yeah, this is like basically saying that you came in and there was a sandcastle and you kicked it over and then you've rebuilt half of it and taking claim for like your ideas being so great. It, it makes absolutely no sense. They have completely wreck the economy are some are there are some signs of improvement now that things are getting better yes a little bit but like things are still pretty tedious and I think it's really disingenuous to not admit that you know we were just talking before we started the show with our producer about how ad dollars are down across platforms because companies are cutting back expecting a recession companies are laying people off especially the media there's tons of layoffs going on the tech sector can needs to cut back I think everybody recognizes that where we're at right now with the Fed, they are probably going to hike interest rates a few more times this year. Things are still very much precarious and hanging in the balance. Most people are anticipating a recession. I don't think anybody feels like they're economically thriving right now. The housing market is still on the brink of like absolutely combusting. It's it's a huge, there's so many factors going on right now that the idea we would tout Bidenomics and celebrate the economy, it's like pick 
anything else he's done. I mean, I would just be like, do not look over here. Don't look at this dumpster fire at all. But I think it's a testament to just how uneducated they think their supporters are. That they Let really me understand. read you a couple quick facts here. So uh, the average American family has lost $7,400 thanks to inflation under Biden. And yet he's bragging about how inflation is half. What that means, folks, is that if inflation was 8%, so you were losing 8% of your purchasing power on an annualized basis, and now it's 4% on an annualized basis, you're still getting poorer just by half as much as you were getting poorer. And a pro normally, you know, inflation would be like 1%, right? So uh, you're still getting poorer. In fact, he says wage growth is starting to outpace inflation. What that means is that the rate of inflation all in Biden's entire presidency until just very recently was higher than the rate of wage growth. So your actual wages were going down so far this entire presidency. They've gone down 3% since Biden took office. And he's like, but finally, it's it's starting to uh, now our wage growth is a little higher than the inflation rate. So it's like we're finally coming out of the red a little bit. And it's like that is not the W you think it is. <laughs> No, but they, again, they just think that their supporters are so dumb that they don't know the difference. And I think well, that I they're unfortunately like, correct. Well, what was that slap? What oh, was God. that? I don't know. <laughs> it's like Biden is an 80-year-old geriatric man. Like nothing <laughs> gives like muscles to me. I The whole thing's weird. I just, I wish Democrats would like cut the crap and just like, look, we are up a creek. We don't have anybody else. We are dependent on this man that might die any moment. Like we're doing the best we can. <laughs> like just level with me. <laughs> yeah. Or just stick to other issues, man. I don't know. They're trying to do damage control and it's just not working. Uh, but you know, you know what else is not working? AOC's attempt to frame herself as a victim because People, when she was a waitress, used to tip her a lot of money, right? I mean, you saw this, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, you guys. I have to read this to you. This was a doozy. I The ability for these people to be victims, no matter how wealthy and powerful they are, is honestly impressive. Like, I'm impressed at this point, AOC. Like, you seem to have been incredibly privileged throughout your life, and yet you will always find some way to talk about yourself. So she's responding to somebody on Twitter that says, what are your best and worst food service industry stories? And they tagged her. So she was in the food industry before she miraculously ended up in Congress, just total overnight success story. Um, she said, oh gosh, there is literally an endless supply here. I have some really weird stories. One time there was this really rich guy who would come in one week a year and was really addicted to mansplaining. You could just tell he got satisfaction from it. He loves to say, ask me a question and include all these little asides to belittle the server and uplift himself. Anyways, if you indulged him, he'd tip like 200 to $300 on a lunch tab every day for a week straight and then disappear for the next year. <laughs> like, that sounds fine to me. I mean, I'm not even in the food service industry, but I just have to go talk to somebody and let them talk to me and mansplain to me for $300 an hour. I'll do it. <laughs> what? So let's just be clear. AOC was oppressed by the sexism here because of mansplaining and it, because some guy wanted to tip two or three hundred dollars on a lunch bill a lunch every tab. day for a week if you talked to him and just kind of splattered him a little and like, oh, tell me more about that. Every service person in America right now is thinking that she was lucky, not that she was oppressed or victimized or that is some horror story of her time in the working class getting like what let's do some math three hundred dollars times five days let's say she meant a work week that's one thousand five hundred dollars she got on tips on lunch orders for chatting with somebody and she's acting like that makes her a victim i mean i'm just always impressed by the mental gymnastics these people can go to the lengths they can go to to find a way to always be victims to always look at the world as a story of how they're oppressed and how things are hard for them even when the actual facts in front of them are really nothing of the sort it's the same way they can say with a straight face that canceling student debt helps the poor when the facts show it helps the affluent right they just they can't be i'm almost impressed i almost want to give them a round of applause for how committed they are to the victimhood script that you really can't deter them from. It's impressive uh, resilience and determination. I will give her points for that. It's also amazing to me just how much she hates men. I mean, 
honestly, we had men like this that came in when I waited tables too. And you know what? We fought over who got to have them as customers because one, they were lovely and they'd tell you stories. They were mostly just old and lonely and they tipped really well. And I just don't understand why you can't have a little bit more grace and kindness for somebody. Like, yeah, maybe he liked coming in and feeling like he got attention from a captive audience and maybe that did make him feel important or smart for a minute and he tips you really well for it and that makes him a bad person. I mean, it's, it's really just mean, actually. Like, sometimes you just need to indulge people. Sometimes people are just lonely. When I worked in all kinds of the service industry wow. sectors, I was constantly struck by that, just how many lonely people were out there, how many people would come in and just, like, tell you, like, their deepest, darkest secrets. And I would just realize, like, these people have nobody else to tell this to. You know, they don't know who else to, like, confide in. They don't have anybody else to use as a sounding board. I found it really deeply sad so I, I think this is interesting of all of her quote, quote, horror stories that she has from working in food service. This this was the pits for her. It sounds like she had a much better experience waiting tables than me because my pit was like kids throwing food at me, people stiffing me on a tip, getting yelled at because a steak wasn't cooked the right way. Like I have some actual horror stories from waiting tables. This getting tipped well to talk to a man who wanted to feel smart for a minute would not be among them. Yeah, and these are the same folks that love to talk about how privileged everyone is. If these are your horror stories, sounds like you were kind of privileged, AOC. Yeah, don't think she's had too long of a road to hoe. All right, well, let's move on to our last quick hit. We've got a clip from Obama here where, surprise, surprise, the former president is continuing to advocate for censorship. Let's roll this clip. While content moderation can limit the distribution of clearly dangerous content, it doesn't go far enough. Users who want to spread disinformation have become experts at pushing right up to the line of what at least published company policies allow. And at those margins, social media platforms tend not to want to do anything. Not just because they don't want to be accused of censorship, because they still have a financial incentive to keep as many users engaged as possible. Now, some companies have been taking the next step in managing toxic content, experimenting with new product designs that, you know, to use just one example, add friction to slow the spread of potentially harm harmful content. And that kind of innovation is a step in the right direction. It should be applauded. But I also think decisions like this shouldn't be left solely to private interests. These decisions affect all of us. And just like every other industry that has a big impact in our society, that means these big platforms need to be subject to some level of public oversight and regulation. So, Brad, I have such a beef with this because I'm a huge proponent of actual free speech, Section 230, and the free market. And everything he just said is a complete attack on all three of those things. And yet he's he's once again bringing these under the guise of really being concerned with information and disinformation and national security. And I just I'm, yeah. I'm fed up with these people, to be frank. I am, too, because it all sounds good if you don't think about it very deeply. But what is clearly dangerous information and speech? What is dis or misinformation? These are subjective and nebulous ideas and terms that can be just smacked onto any speech you don't like. And also, most importantly, what yesterday's misinformation is not always, but sometimes today's truth. A great example of this is Facebook did the kind of thing that Obama is lauding here banning misinformation when they deleted people from uh, saying from any or they censored anyone who suggested that the COVID may have come from a lab leak in Wuhan. Now, many government agencies believe that's the most likely cause of the pandemic. Uh, because, but that misinformation turned out to be true and it, it, they tried to throttle it. And he calls the throttling of misinformation an innovation that should be applauded. No, it's the opposite of that. It's stopping the free flow of information and exchange of ideas that allows for innovation and the discovery of truth. All of this stuff. 
And then, of course, you know, it's just totally a disregard for the First Amendment, which says the government should come in and regulate what speech is allowed on these platforms. They really don't have the constitutional right to do that. If they shouldn't be able to tell Facebook, you can allow Fox News, but not CNN, or you can allow this information about uh, this treatment, but not this information. I mean, that is a free speech constitutional issue. But more importantly, I don't trust the government to decide what's true and what's accurate and what isn't because they just in the last couple of years have gotten too many things wrong to count and they're always going to have political concerns at heart. So to me, this all sounds very good. It sounds like neoliberal and technocratic and like they're going to solve problems through putting the experts in charge, but it's actually a recipe for suppression and for regressive authoritarianism in many ways. So I just find this kind of stuff chilling, frankly. I don't think Obama gets enough criticism for the oppressive president that he was. This is somebody who prosecuted whistleblowers more than any other administration before him. He was very punitive on people who tried to shed light on the government's activities. So I think for Obama, disinformation is anything that undercuts his official narrative. It's anything that undermines the government. It's anything that actually holds people acting within it accountable. And there is a vested interest for people of his ilk to try to suppress information, to try to suppress speech, and to try to scare anybody who might try to push back against these very large powers in our society. So I think that this should be taken as sinister as, po as possible. I think this is actually a very creepy thing for him to say. I think he was a complete loser of a president for that reason. And I'm still mad to this day that when he was in office, the mainstream media did absolutely nothing to hold him accountable for all of these violations against basic civil liberties and basic values that up until his administration, the left had purported to hold. He was he was such a hypocrite on everything from these types of issues to war powers to just basic human ethics. And I, I really think that it's disgusting. He's not been held more accountable. His Nobel Peace Prize needs to be stripped from him. I, I just think he's a warmongering hack. And, you know, he's a great public speaker and he's very likable when he speaks. And I think that's helped him to sort of be able to come out and say these kinds of things and it not sound as menacing as it actually should to people. But what he's saying is he wants to come in and use the government to force companies and the free market to suppress the speech of citizens. That is what he is saying, plain and simple. And you can couch it in things like regulations or you can say it's, you know, to make people safer. No, it is to strip you of your liberties, which has been one of his main agenda items ever since he came to power. And people like this should frighten you and they should be universally condemned. So I'll just give one example that shows you how dysfunctional and unworkable this idea from Obama even is. Back when he was president and he was pushing through Obamacare, one of his famous talking points was, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Now, that has since been fact-checked, declared one of the biggest lies of recent political history. That is not true. A lot of people weren't able to keep their doctors under Obamacare. But at the time, if you had been out there saying, you won't be able to keep your doctor under Obamacare, well, the government would have considered that misinformation or disinformation or clearly dangerous and undermining trust in government or whatever. Should it? And so theoretically, under this kind of framework, they could have told Facebook to not allow people to say that or companies should have suppressed it algorithmically when in fact it turned out to be true. And this happens time and time again with the Republicans or Democrats. It's just the political class, the government is not particularly tethered to the truth uh, on many things. So the idea that we're going to allow them to be the arbiter of what is true and what is not, of what is misinformation, what is disinformation, what is accurate information, to me is just insane. In fact, what we should do is, you know, it's messy when we just leave that to the free market of ideas and let people say things that aren't true and then others debunk it and fact check it. I like solutions like Twitter's community notes where people can fact check each other and that kind of thing. And it's not a perfect system, like false ideas spread and bad things get said. And yes, look, it was once considered misinformation and blasphemy to suggest that the earth was not the center of the universe, that the sun was, right? And that sounds like an ancient example because it is, but it also, we see that play out today with things like the lab leak and other things. So. We can't have any one entity, whether it's big tech or the government, as the arbiter of truth in our society. We need to let people speak freely and spread bad or false ideas and let other people shine a light with truth. And then the truth will emerge in the end over time. 
much better than in this kind of Orwellian system Obama envisions. Yeah, but I would say that's because he doesn't actually want the truth, right? He doesn't actually care about the truth or disinformation. What he wants is to protect the official narrative. And I would say that almost anybody else in his camp is either extremely naive or is also after that agenda. So people need to be wary of people that are using these talking points. They're increasing on both the left and right, and they need to be condemned and shut down. All right, let's move on to our mailbag. Uh, Hannah says that, uh, oh, sorry, Josh Rosen says, Hannah, people need to get a grip at airports or I will run them over. Brad, I just like me some Ted Lasso. <laughs> he says the yin and yang in this week's hot takes are on point. P.S. just became a supporter over on your guys' website recently. Hope for the best. Thank you so much. You yeah. guys should join him over on our locals for $5 a month. Help us uh, produce this podcast. It's really helpful. Absolutely. Thanks for your support. Uh, Eduardo says, Brad is so cute with a bunch of heart eye emojis. I agree. <laughs> um, Hannah was, uh, Carol says, Hannah was so right equating Leninist and Marx and Maoism with Nazism. I do think some of these crazy ideologies get a pass uh, when they have hi historical death counts that are right up there or exceed Nazism. Nazism. Yeah, it always drives me nuts. I, I think both should be completely condemned. And, and I think that more people need to be aware of just my deaths have occurred under communism. So that's always bothered me. So this next one, I want to clarify what it's referencing. We were talking about like COVID mandates and we brought up HIV. And I think it was suggested at one point that like, if you knowingly expose someone to HIV, you would possibly, they would almost certainly get it. I think that's actually not accurate. Uh, I think that the chance is, is not 100% and that many people with HIV are undetectable if they're properly medicated. And if you're uh. undetectable, you can't really give another person HIV with very low, uh, very low percentages. So uh, Gregory says to say one would spread it 100% of the time is not necessarily true. Um, and he says, I enjoy your channel and your talks with each other. I just want to let you know that what I found, that I found what you said to be a little offensive. I think people with HIV are very stigmatized for no good reason. So many people I know are scared to tell anyone because of how people talk about it like this. But that being said, I still respect you too and enjoy your channel. For me, I appreciate that. I think uh, I'm glad to clarify that about, we kind of mentioned that off the cuff. We were really talking about COVID mandates, uh, but it just does sound like we got that wrong. Uh, and we certainly don't mean to stigmatize people with HIV. I absolutely don't believe in that um, uh, with any disease, but especially with the history of the HIV AIDS crisis and the way it was stigmatized that hits home for me. So I am sorry personally if we made you feel that way. Yeah, I agree with that. We would never want to ever stigmatize that disease further. I think it's really tragic what has happened to people in that community and that we were speaking off the cuff. So thanks for the clarification. You learn something new every day. Uh, Cindy says, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Aristotle, thank you for representing the majority in the middle with factual, rational content. Keep up the good work. I think I quoted that quote last podcast and attributed it to Mark Twain. So maybe it's Aristotle. It might be one but... of those like quotes that floats around or whatever. Yeah. You know? Great quote though. I love it. Great quote. Uh, EMK says, this podcast is the best, no doubt. As a lesbian teenager, finding people who agree with me in my politics is hard. Being right of center makes it increasingly difficult because my physical community only goes to the extreme right or left. It is so amazing to have finally found an environment where common sense and basic human decency is the norm. Thank you so much, EMK. Um, shout out to all my LGBT YouTube subscribers. There's a quiet army of people in that community that are low key center right <laughs> and not, <laughs> not on board with kind of leftism. Uh, so power to you. Good. I hope your whole community is, is helping them be a little bit more outspoken because we need those mainstream middle of the road voices. All right, let's move on to hot takes. Mine this week, you're not going to relate to Brad. But it's that getting your nails done is one of the most atrocious experiences in a person's life. And we have to do it every two weeks or so if you want to keep your nails, you know, did. And I hate it. And I just think that the industry is ripe for innovation. I would like to propose that there should be a service when you're sleeping where somebody can come do your nails. Because it's so boring. You can't do anything. You can't even play with your phone. You're just sitting there in your little foil wrappers waiting for your nails, you know, to get redone. 
and it's not enjoyable and there's drills involved and it hurts your ears and it's like it's just awful everything about it sucks i would like to be able to have my nails done in a more peaceful environment or maybe like when you're at the movie theater you know you can't do anything else there either they come and do your nails there i think that would be awesome and i think most women would agree with me wouldn't that be kind of loud during a movie yeah i guess they couldn't use the drills that might be disruptive maybe they could have a special theater for women like where it shows you know chick flicks and we go in and get our nails done and that way people don't mind the extra noise and they can just turn the movie up really loud yeah okay then uh work. <laughs> <laughs> so my hot take is a fourth of july hot take because i didn't get to do it last week and it is simply this i am anti-fireworks and i don't care if that makes me a- anti-american first off no one cares about your shitty cell phone quality video of fireworks. We all have fireworks near us and nobody needs to see them all flooded over social media. Y'all make a, a social media unusable for 24 hours after the 4th of July because it's just crappy secondhand videos of fireworks. We've all seen fireworks. Yours are not particularly unique or interesting and phones can't capture them well anyway. Um, but also, you know how many people die because of fireworks? You know how much property damage there is? How many children are injured and like burn off their finger? Or I heard something briefly on the radio of them talking about those stats. And I was like, all for what? For what? For some cheap entertainment for just, I, I don't find them entertaining. They're just blowing lights up. You've seen it once. You've seen it a million times. I think they're lame. I think they're totally not worth it. I certainly don't think they should be illegal. Um, I'm not, you know, saying anything like that. But I just find them to be incredibly lame. And also think of all the the trauma caused to the nation's dogs every 4th of July. Also, you guys can blow crap up and put crappy Snapchat stories up of it. I'm just, to me, it's a hard no. That was pretty un-American and honestly a direct attack on the South because I can't think of anything we like more than fireworks down here. I happen to love them. I was glad where I was this year didn't have them the day of because I was nervous about Phoenix, so... I don't know how he would have done. I might feel differently at that point, but I think they're beautiful. I do agree with you about the crappy cell phone video part, though. It's kind of like I do this at a concert all the time, too, where I like start to take videos and I'm like, no, nobody wants your crappy video of this concert. So I will record don't a video at that. a concert for myself to for have you. on my camera roll because yeah. then uh, it will remind me of my experience there, even though it's obviously not great quality. But to post it to social media is dumb. Like no one cares and they can go, if they want to see that person perform live, they can look up like a live video on YouTube where it's actually properly recorded. Yeah. So I agree. Keep those videos to yourself. And if you have a dog, medicate them maybe before the works. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Hope you enjoyed the episode. As Brad said, you can always go to our locals and subscribe if you want to support the show. Also, leave us a comment or a review on Apple iTunes. We'll read it on the show. And until next week, stay base.